I am Professor Mira Deo. I'm here at the 2018 AALS meeting in San Diego to interview Julie Greenberg. Thank you for coming. Thank you for asking me. So um, I'm excited to learn more about you and your story and to memorialize it today through this oral history. I'm going to try to move relatively quickly through our first dozen or so questions um, so that we can focus more time on your experiences in legal academia. Okay. Um, but you can, of course, feel free to stop me anytime if there's something you want to add or we're moving too quickly. Um, just let me know and we can spend more time. Sure. So um, first, with regard to your personal background, can you tell me a little bit about where you were born and um, where you grew up? So I was born in Detroit in 1951. I spent all of my growing up years in the city of Detroit mm -hmm. um, and stayed there until I went to college at University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. And what about your family when you were young? Can you tell me what your parents were like, what kind of work they did? Um, I was a very typical child of the 50s. We had an, you know, Ozzy and Harriet type existence where my father worked, my mother did work while we needed the money. We had a small family business and she worked in the family business, but the goal was to have her not be working. And so at the point that we could afford for her not to work, then she stayed home. What and kind of business was it? A restaurant equipment supply business. Hmm. And who else worked there? It was a family business. So my father had three other brothers mm -hmm. and the four brothers owned the business together. So everybody in the family but me <laughs> worked uh -huh. there. So all of my Cousins worked there, aunts worked there, uncles, it, and there were a lot of other, there were a fair number of other employees as well, but it was a family business. And when you say everyone worked there except for you, why do you think that is? <laughs> um, well, I'll tell a story. Um, I had worked there every summer mm -hmm. and every Saturday, so I would always go in with my father and do filing and other chores there, but I really didn't like the work of being a secretary. And so, although I did it my whole growing up years, once I graduated college, um, it was the height of the baby boom looking for jobs, and I couldn't get a job, and so I was gonna do a waitressing job. Mm -hmm. And my father was like, no, you're gonna go work in the family business. And I was, I really don't wanna work in the family business. And he guilt-tripped me into it and said, just do it until we find somebody to replace you. So I did it, and then when I went to quit, because they weren't gonna find anybody to replace me, um, I went to my uncle and said, I'm not gonna be working here anymore. And he said, what do you mean you're not gonna be working here anymore? And I said, I never wanted to work here. And his response was, what do you mean? Of course you're working here. And finally I said to him, did you think I went to Michigan, graduated with honors, to basically come back and work at the family business until some poor guy would agree to marry me and then I'd go start having babies. And he said with a totally straight face, yes. And I said, <laughs> no. So, Didn't know you very well. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, but a lot of my cousins had done exactly that. So I was kind of an odd person not choosing mm -hmm. to do that. Did you have siblings working there too? My brother, I have one brother and that's what he did. He finished college and started working there. Mm -hmm. But the boys were being groomed to take over the business and the girls were to work in the office mm -hmm. until they could get married and have babies. And then no longer work there? Of course not. Mm -hmm. Were there other relatives or family friends, um, others who were important to you as a child? So I was, <clears throat> I was thinking about that and there's just one woman who really stands out and that was my Girl Scout troop leader, mm -hmm. who was really totally out of sync with um, what was going on at the time. So she was a very strong leader and she wanted to make sure our Girl Scout troop did everything that the Boy Scout troops did. So mm -hmm. for instance, when the Detroit Tigers had Little League Day, we were the only softball team uh -huh. to be invited to Little League Day because she just said, well, if the boys are going, the girls should go. And I remember I stayed in Girl Scouts until it was either seventh or eighth grade, which is pretty long, because she was just such a great leader and we did camping and hiking and, mm -hmm. and um, didn't earn a lot of merit badges in sewing and cooking. Mm -hmm. You were talking about going to college. When you were young, did you know or expect that you would go on to college and, or did that decision come later to you? I think the expectation was, my parents were not college educated. Um, 
and none of my aunts or uncles were college educated, but I think the expectation for our generation was that everybody would go to college. And did they? Uh, not everybody, but almost, almost all my cousins did. A few did not. So why do you think, how do you think that expectation changed, where they didn't, but they expected all of you to? I'm sorry, were the, for the people who chose not to go to college? Sorry, for the, the, your parents' generation, you said most of, or none of them, uh, most of them did not go to college. None of them maybe went to college. Them. And yet all of them expected that their children would go. So how do you think that came about? I think that's immigrant related. You know, my grandparents were all immigrants. Mm -hmm. um, my parents' generation were born in the States, but really, really poor. And the thought of college was, you yeah. know, my, my mother graduated high school at 16. You know, so she graduated early and immediately went to work. There was no mm -hmm. question that anybody could afford to go to college. Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about college? I know you said you went to the University of Michigan. Mm -hmm. um, how did you pick that school? Um, so I wasn't that savvy about going to college because I didn't have any role models or mentors to talk to me about it. And pretty much everybody in my high school who went to college applied to the Michigan universities. I mean, I remember learning about kids in my class going to out-of-state schools and I went, I thought you were supposed to go to school in the state that you grew up in. I didn't even know that you could go to out-of-state schools was how naive I was. And then it was pretty much you applied to the different universities and Michigan was known as the best of the state universities and so that's where I chose to go. Mm -hmm. Did you live on campus at that time? I don't know how far it was from where you had been living in Detroit. Uh, Detroit and Ann Arbor are about 40 miles apart so I moved on to campus immediately. Mm -hmm. Do you remember any particular teachers or mentors who influenced you in college? So anyone like the Girl Scout troop leader or others who had an impact? So actually, I don't want to sound negative on Michigan because I really loved my experience there, but um, I was extraordinarily shy and I never spoke in class. I mean, and when I say never, I mean never, ever, ever asked a question in class, mm -hmm. volunteered an answer in class went to see a professor outside mm -hmm. of class until one time in statistics. I, de I was doing fine in the class, but I didn't understand what standard deviation was. And so I decided to go to the professor and I told him, look, I can calculate it, mm -hmm. but I have no idea what I'm calculating. Mm -hmm. Can you please define what is a standard deviation? And he turned to me and he said, can you define love? And I said, no. And he said, well, then I can't define standard deviation. So that killed any <laughs> desire on my part to be mentored by any mm -hmm. professors. Because, you know, when I finally got up the courage to go see a professor, it wasn't a very positive experience. So I would say um, I had teaching fellows that I thought were very good and inspiring. And I had good professors, mm -hmm. but I never had a mentor-mentee relationship mm -hmm. with any of them. So when did you decide to go to law school? Were you in college and you were thinking about going, or how did that decision come about? That's a really long story. Okay. So um, you can narrow it down if I start digressing too much. So when I went to college, I was a psych major, mm -hmm. and I really wanted to be a clinical psychologist, but that was a very popular program to get into. So when I applied to graduate schools, I got into some research programs, but I didn't get into any clinical programs, and I didn't want to do research, I wanted to do clinical. So I decided to wait mm -hmm. for a year and apply again, and then I got a job at a hospital, Ypsilanti State Hospital, which is um, a hospital for emotionally disturbed people, and I worked in the adolescent unit. Oh, wow. And I did that for a year, and then decided, well, I don't really want to be a clinical psychologist. I'd rather be a social worker. Mm -hmm. So I applied to social work schools, got in, and then they gave me a promotion at work. And I said, well, I think I'll stay out for another year. So I then told, I think it was Michigan, that I wasn't going to go to social work school. And then after another year of working in the field, I said, mm, I'm not sure I'm really cut out to be a clinician. I just get too involved with the mm -hmm. kids. So I said, okay, I'll be a hospital administrator. So then I applied to hospital administration school, and um, I got in, and I was all set to go. Literally, I had my car all packed up. I was going to go to Berkeley, and my father had cancer, and the doctor said he's not going to survive. And so um, I called Berkeley and said, I can't come. 
And so I stayed at home, and my mom had a lot of needs, so I stayed at home with my mom after my father died. And then I kind of was a lost soul, so I, um, after staying at home for quite a few months, I decided to travel. So I went and put everything in a backpack and went to Israel and stayed with my family in Israel and traveled around Israel. And then when I came back, um, I was still a lost soul, so I thought, okay, I'm really good in math, I'll go be a CPA. So I started taking accounting classes to be a CPA. I'm almost to the point of law school. I love the story, so <laughs> keep going. <laughs> Um, this is not a goal-directed person. <laughs> um, yet. 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 Um, so I took some CPA classes, accounting classes, and said, oh my God, this is incredibly boring. I apologize to all the CPAs out there, but I just thought, I can't do this all day long. So then I was like, okay, I need to apply to graduate school. And law school... I hate to say it, was an easier graduate school than getting a PhD mm -hmm. and spending the time, the extra years, and the dissertation. So I went to law school because I thought it was an easy graduate program to go to. Mm -hmm. Wow. So how many years were you off between college and law school then? Five and a half. Okay. During the time that you were working and then traveling and Yeah, it was either four and a half or five again. and a half, yeah. And so, um, I, I know, because I know you, that you went to Michigan for law school. Can you tell us a little about how you picked that school as the one you would go to? Because at this point, right, you had already applied more broadly. You'd gotten into a graduate program at Berkeley, so you certainly, your horizons were open. You knew there were lots of other options. So how did you end up again in Michigan? Incredibly naive. I mean, it just, I, no, I did not know I had options. I still, I didn't know anybody who was a lawyer. I didn't have anybody to go to to say, what law school should I apply to? And um, so I did the intelligent thing of saying, where do I want to live? And then I applied to cities, schools and cities where I wanted to live. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to go to kind of a medium-sized town. So I applied to Seattle and Portland and San Diego and Denver, and Michigan is my fallback. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> Perhaps uh, the highest ranked school of the ones you've listed absolutely. <laughs> as a fallback. A absolutely. But, and really what it was is because there had been family problems, and I saw what happened when I applied to Berkeley, I thought I should apply in state. There were still some things going on in my family's personal mm -hmm. life that I knew that I might need to be near home to help out. And so I applied to Michigan, not intending to go to Michigan. And then I got into all of those schools and I called a family friend who was going to USD's law school at the time, I had forgotten about him, and said to him, so I got in at all these places, where should I go? And he said, go to Michigan. And I said, I really want to get out of here. And he yeah. said, go to Michigan. And I said, okay. So that's how I stayed at Michigan. And were you right? Was it ultimately helpful that you were local in terms of being able to help out with family things? And oh, words? absolutely, absolutely. All right, so I was asking what law school was like. What sort of stands out to you about law school? Um, I loved law school. I had a great time in law school. I made a lot of very close friendships, you know, people who I'm still very close with now. Um, so overall, I'd say law school was a very positive personal experience. Mm -hmm. um, did you want to know more about I the educational experience? Yeah, when, what year did you graduate? Uh, from law school, 79. So were there any particular teachers who influenced you in law school? Um, so I'm going to sound like a complainer given what I said about my undergraduate education, but the years I was at Michigan, there weren't, it was, you know, much more of a Socratic method, and there were a fair number of professors who would just love to take students down mm -hmm. in front of the class. Mm -hmm. And I just found that to be abhorrent, mm -hmm. just really abhorrent. And there were a number of sexist things that were said. And the professors I really loved were the ones who just showed respect for the students. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were good teachers, and they truly wanted to teach, and they showed respect for the students. And it really stood out the difference between different yeah. faculty members. Do you remember some of the problematic things that were said? Um, do you want me to tell you the worst one? Sure. So the worst one was in torts. 
where we were studying wrongful birth actions and the woman who was pregnant after the doctor was supposed to have performed, mm -hmm. um, why am I drawing a blank on the word? Um, the sterilization, basically. Um, so um, she, he botched it. She had another baby and it was her fourth baby. And the professor had the chutzpah to stand up in front of the class, and we were talking about what damages are recoverable, you know, the cost of raising the kid, the hospital bills, pain and suffering. And he said, oh, come on, how much pain and suffering is there? On the fourth one, it just slips right out. And luckily, a woman in the front row stood up and said, how dare you? How dare you say that? I've had three children, and none of them just slip right out. But that to me was probably the most horrifying. Mm -hmm. yeah. How many women would you say were in your class? It was about 20% women. Okay. I think my particular section, Michigan overall was about 20%. I think my particular section had more women in it because we started in the summer. Mm -hmm. And I think just for some reason there were more women there. It felt like more than 20% in our class. So you said that you made some close friendships when you were in law school. Did you find that you were you and the other women sort of gravitated towards one another, or were most of those close friendships with the 80% of the class that was men, or how did you? It was mixed. My closest friend, who's actually still my closest friend and now lives two miles away from me, um, is a female. But it was we had a, just a group of people, mixture of men and women, mm -hmm. that were very supportive of each other. So, you know, you mentioned the story already, but do you have other... Um, observations about what it was like to be one of, you know, sort of a minority in terms of gender, right, where there's only 20% of you in this whole class. Did you feel like the professors treated you any differently or um, that, that it seemed different at all because you were a woman? Um, I don't think so. I think that, um, no, I, I didn't have any experiences where I would say that the professors favored the men, mm -hmm. or at least that I was aware of where they favored the men or they were more dismissive of the woman. I mean, now that I've read all the literature, I'm sure there were things that I just wasn't observant enough to see what was happening, but I didn't notice. I didn't feel that as, that was my experience when I was at Michigan. And were you, at the, as you were in college, kind of reluctant to speak up and share your perspectives? I mean, I know if there's the Socratic method, you're gonna participate anyway, um, but what was your participation like? I did not participate in law school. I did not answer questions. I would sometimes say, I shouldn't confess this, but I would say I'm unprepared rather than talk in class was how shy I was. Even though you were prepared. I was prepared, mm -hmm. sometimes. <laughs> um, and I just, you know, in that environment with 100 people in, a, in most of my classes, it was just not an area. I mean, if professors went up and down the row and I knew my turn was coming, then I obviously spoke, but otherwise, I didn't volunteer. Where I actually felt much more comfortable is I did the clinic. I did the child advocacy clinic, mm -hmm. and that was just that was my absolutely the best experience at Michigan. And there I felt very comfortable. And the the guy who ran it um, was just fantastic on mentoring. Who people. is that? Don Doucette. Mm -hmm. Is that his, do you, is that how you pronounce his name? Not sure. I think um, it's Doucette is how they pronounced it. And what what about that experience was? so important to you when you say that he was really phenomenal and the experience was by far the best one. Um, what about that experience was so great? Um, well, one, we were actually being lawyers. Mm -hmm. And so Michigan had, I don't know if it still has the program, but it was a wonderful program because Ann Arbor's kind of at the um, meeting of three counties. And so they set up the program so that in one county you represented um, the children in one county you represented the parents and in one county you represented mm -hmm. the state mm -hmm. and they made sure you got cases in all of them so I just felt like I was really learning what it was like to be a lawyer and he'd have you know he'd go over and practice our cross-examinations and he just did everything to make you feel as comfortable as you could feel going into a courtroom as a second-year law student mm -hmm. so he was really wonderful can you tell me about faculty diversity, if, if any at your school? Was it all white men? Was there any age range diversity? Like what, or what was it like? There was no diversity. There were two women. There was one black 
professor that I can remember who was also the, one of the women. Mm -hmm. I don't remember. I mean, I didn't know all of the faculty, but of the faculty I had, all were white males following a very, very traditional path. Mm -hmm. Did you notice it at the time? Is it something that stood out to you as problematic or different, or was that sort of the norm and the expectation? You know, I grew up in a family where the men were kind of dominant, so to me it was just like, yeah, here's more of it. You know, mm -hmm. I, it was kind of what I expected it would be. Yeah. So when you were talking about the clinic, you said one of the things you loved was that you got to be actually practicing like a lawyer and you learned so much there. Um, did you think about going into child advocacy in the future, or what were your plans if you had any while you were in law school for what you might do after? Um, I started law school I, that I was going to do something that was for the social good. It might have been with children because I had worked with children mm -hmm. at the hospital before that. Um, so I didn't have, I didn't really know about specific job opportunities, mm -hmm. but that was my fantasy when I went into law school is that I would use my psych background, my experience with kids, and my law degree and put them all together. Mm -hmm. And then I sold out. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you mean by you sold out? How did your vision change over time? Um, you know, I just went through the whole interviewing process, which was, of course, all the big law firms. I got a job at a big law firm in San Diego. Mm -hmm. They wined and dined us all summer long. And I thought, this is Disneyland. This is wonderful. The people are all really nice. And um, so after working there for the summer and having them give me a permanent offer, I said, I'll take it. And I didn't really look very hard for, you know, a job Did achieving you? the goals that I had when I went into law school. Mm -hmm. uh, what was your family's response to you moving? Because I, obviously they, it sounded like they would have, they wanted everyone to be nearby, right, if right. possible. Everybody else was in the business. Um, so how did they respond to you taking this job, even for a summer far away, and then moving there potentially permanently after? Um, I don't remember anybody saying anything to me. I'm sure my mother was upset about it, but mm -hmm. I was also pretty strong-willed, so I think she probably also knew that she wasn't going to convince me otherwise, so it didn't really come up. Mm -hmm. And when you moved, did you move on your own? <coughs> Just, was it just you who yeah, moved to San me. Diego? Okay. So tell me about this job then. Your first legal job at a firm in San Diego. What kind of job was it? Um, what kind of cases or issues did you work on? So um, this is definitely not going to fit in with our discussion so far, but when I graduated law school, I wanted to be a tax attorney. I take a lot, again, math was kind of my forte. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I take in all the tax classes that one could take and I was very comfortable in that field, and so I was going to go into um, the tax department. And then, right before I moved to San Diego, um, the tax department. There were two major firms in San Diego at the time, and the two fir the tax departments of the two major firms left between the summer that I took the job and actually when I got there, and went and formed a boutique firm to do all taxes. So there was one person left doing tax at the law firm, and so. Um, there wasn't enough tax work for me to do, so I kind of, I was really a lost soul. I just flitted department to department, and mm -hmm. I pretty much tried every department there was before. And did you, what was your plan at the time? Did you think, I'm going to stay here, I'm going to make partner? Um, what, did you have sort of a goal for your early time there at the firm? You know, people didn't really leave law firms then. You know, I started in 1980, mm -hmm. and... Um, the expectation was you stayed, if you did well, you made partner, and in San Diego it wasn't very cutthroat, you know, like the New York firms then, you had no idea if you would make partner, mm -hmm. not no idea, but there was no guarantee. Yeah. In San Diego, even in the big firms, if you did a good job, got good reviews, you didn't worry that much mm -hmm. about making partner. So. Um, I didn't think about it that much, but I was pretty unhappy working there. So no, that really wasn't my long-term vision that um, I would stay there long enough to make partner because it just wasn't a good fit for me. How did you pick this particular firm and how did you pick San Diego as a market? Well, I did the same intelligent thing I did when I applied to law schools. I went back to all those cities I wanted to live in yeah. 
and now I started applying at the law firms in those cities. And um, people were very skeptical about people coming from Michigan who had no connection to mm -hmm. these West Coast cities. Mm -hmm. And I ended up with offers in San Francisco, San Diego, and Chicago. And I spent a lot of time in both Chicago and San Francisco, but not in San Diego. So I thought, sure, why not go there for the summer? And then really liked it. Like I said, they treated us very nicely. And um, so that's why I decided to go there. Were there any other women lawyers working at your firm? So when I started, there were, pro there were somewhere between 60 and 70 lawyers, mm -hmm. and I was the sixth woman. And um, it was not a friendly place for women. And it was interesting because up until the class right before mine, they only hired women that were older, had already had their kids. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was a pattern that mm -hmm. was very obvious that it's like, you know, we don't want anybody coming in in their childbearing years. We yeah. want, And so it was really just the class right before mine hired a younger single woman, and then my class did too. And and how many were in your class? Or how was many it just women? You? No, it was two out of six were okay. women. Did you have um, any different relationship with the women as compared to the men at the firm? Um, the women reached out more, but it was um, there was a lot of sexual harassment that went on that everybody was very hush hush about. What kinds of things? Oh, everything, you know, just straight out hitting on secretaries, hitting on paralegals, hitting on female attorneys, um, you know, just some of the worst stuff that I think, you know, I don't know that it went on at every law firm, mm -hmm. but, and the women, we didn't talk about it. We didn't, it was like this, you know, cone of silence that you just, didn't talk about it. And then eventually when, when we got to know each other better and people started talking about it, there really wasn't anything of, well, let's do something about this. Why not? Um, I just think it was, that, that was the time when you knew that the partner was gonna keep the job and the associate was gonna get fired. Mm -hmm. And every single one of them was a married male partner and female associates. Mm -hmm. Were you married at the time? No, I wasn't. How did you meet your partner? How did, <laughs> um, we met at a Halloween party. Mm -hmm. um, I was dressed as a Tylenol capsule, and he was dressed as John DeLorean, <laughs> if you want more. <laughs> was this at, at roughly this period of time in your life? or? Uh, so this was after I'd been in the law firm for about a year and a half, mm -hmm. or two years. How long was I there? Two years. So it's while you were still at the firm? Yes. Okay. I actually have a funny story in that if you're going to ask yes, about Yes, please. Go ahead. So, um, Rob, who's my husband and the person we're talking about, and I met, and um, he had come out, and he was a federal clerk for Judge Keep, and he he's such a sweet, naive person. He's a few years younger than I am. And on our first date, we were walking along the beach in Pacific Beach, and he said to me, so tell me how you like working at your law firm. And I said, well, I just gave my notice today. <laughs> and he said, no, 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 be serious. How do you like working at your law firm? I said, I just gave my notice today. And he's like, oh, okay. <laughs> so, um, so I kind of met him once I had already decided to get out of the law yeah. firm, which is probably the reason the relationship grew, because I was so miserable when I was at the law firm. Yeah. that I don't think it would have happened. Did you have any mentors there or anyone who you felt was kind of, who had your interests at heart even? Oh, I think there, yeah, there were a couple women mm -hmm. who definitely had my interests at heart. Um, I wouldn't say that they actually mentored me in the sense of guiding me, but mm -hmm. I knew that they were there if I needed them. Did and you rely on them for anything? So if they weren't necessarily opening all these doors for you, what kinds of things did they do to help? Um, I don't know. I guess just more of a sense that they were there as a support system if I needed them. Really, the person I, who I used as a support person was um, the other woman who was hired the year I was hired. Mm -hmm. And we just bonded because we were both... I mean, there were a number of times I would just go into her office or she'd come into my office and go... Are we in the twilight zone? Because there were so many things that would go on that we were like, 
is this really the 1980s and they're still saying and doing this kind of stuff? I mean, I'll give you one example that's a, an easier one. So they had, I was a big softball player and with the summer clerks they had, so we had this like recreational league and then there was a more competitive league mm -hmm. and they didn't ask me to play. And I went to the, the partner who was organizing it and I said, how come you asked all the other summer clerks to play and not me? And he said, well, you're a woman. And I said, you know how I play because you've seen me play. If I played the way I play and I were a guy, would you have asked me to play? And he said, yes. I said, then put me on the team. <laughs> and he put me on the team. They only played me the minimum amount of innings, but they put me on the mm -hmm. team. But, you know, the fact that it was like, yeah. and, you know, I mean, lots of things that were so harmful. I mean, even the, the nice guys, like there was this, this one guy who's like the classic gentleman who like loved mentoring people but he only mentored the male associates because mm -hmm. he wouldn't go out to a bar mm -hmm. or take a female unmarried associate to dinner because that just wasn't what one does so you couldn't get mentored even by the people who respected women and wanted to help everybody succeed they just they wouldn't do it mm -hmm. Did you feel that you and the woman hired at the same time as you, did you see eye to eye on most things? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And then how did you get, I know you mentioned giving notice, so obviously you left that job. How did you get from there to your first job in legal academia? Well, this is really well planned out. <laughs> but I didn't plan my life very much. Um, I left the law firm, and interestingly, I was so miserable, I just said, I'm quitting, I'm not doing another job, I've saved enough money, I can support myself. And so I quit the law firm and um, then I decided to work part-time for the tax boutique firm. Uh -huh. So I started working part-time for them and then teaching came along very serendipitously. Um, a guy who was gonna be teaching corporations had heart surgery and they needed somebody to replace them and somebody gave them my name and said she's just working part-time so she should be able mm -hmm. to do this so I filled in on like three days notice and started teaching oh and then yeah it was kind of crazy um, but I it was also a class um, that met Monday Wednesday Friday 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. it was a one-month class so um, it was really crazy and um, what happened is then I had, in my life, I could compare. What do I, how do I feel when I go to work at the law firm versus how do I feel when I get in front of the classroom? And this was better? Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 6 to 10 p.m. with three days of prep? I loved it. <laughs> I just, I loved it. And I just said, okay, this mm -hmm. is what you want to do. And so... So in those three days, did you have time? Or what, what did you do to prepare in any way for that class? Well, this is, this is really ironic, is... Um, it was the second half of, it was Corporations 2, mm -hmm. and so I had to use the book that they had used for Corporations 1, and luckily I had had as my professor the guy who wrote the book and taught out of the book, Perfect. and I still had my notes, and so I could like have all my notes and go, oh, I know what I'm supposed to cover here, so, and I really had fun, it really wasn't, mm -hmm. you know how when you just are on the treadmill, you just keep going, so I actually, I wasn't whining and complaining then, I was loving every minute of it. What law school was this at? This was at National University. And what was the process like for you to be, I mean, I guess it's hired, right? Maybe not in a full-time permanent way, but what was the process like for them to bring you on? There wasn't a process. They desperately needed somebody to teach and I was available. Mm -hmm. And so there was no interview that was just, okay, she's qualified, let's take her. And then how long were you there at that law school? I don't remember exactly, but I was teaching there and then um, an opportunity came up to be a legal, because they only had part-time professors at that time. They, they just hired adjuncts. I don't think, I don't remember if they had any full-time professors or if they did, it was very few. And a, um, a full-time legal writing instructor position came up at USD, so I applied for that and mm -hmm. got that one. So that was really the first real interview process. All right, so um, full-time legal writing at USD. Mm -hmm. How long were you in that position? Two years. And what was it like there? Um, I mean, I know you have the firm to compare it to, but then you also had this other one-month position, so... Well, I actually had a few years teaching at National before I went oh, to you USD. Did. Okay. Yeah. Um, 
And then, what, during that time, you continued working at the tax boutique part time yes. as well. Okay. Yes. Um, and so USD's was interesting. Um, again, I really wasn't a voting member of the faculty or anything, so. I wasn't intimately involved with the faculty. The woman who ran the legal writing program was a wonderful mentor, just a wonderful, wonderful person. So, mm -hmm. um, so that that was very positive. But um, I left USD. This is also an interesting story. I became pregnant, and um, I said, "So, what are we going to do?" I'm due in February. That's when the the students are doing their oral arguments, which is not a time that you can really be absent. So I went to the person in charge, not my immediate boss, and said, "What are we going to do?" And she said, "Well, if you need to take a few days off, you can take a few days off when you give birth." And I was like, "What?" And actually, it was really a, a very awful situation because what she did is she pulled her assistant in and kept grilling her assistant saying, well, how much time did you take off? You didn't need that much time off, did you? It was horrible. And, you know, she just totally put her assistant on the spot, which I felt so bad for her. And then I said, you know, what happens if I have a cesarean section? You need more than two days off. And she said, so take a full week. I said, and finally, it was just ridiculous. I, it was very clear that this wonderful Catholic family-oriented school mm -hmm. was not going to support a woman who gave birth. And I finally just said, you know what, it's not going to work. I can't continue to work under those circumstances. It's three months before the next semester starts. I gave them plenty of notice. I said, why don't you just go find somebody to replace me? And the response was, how dare you? And I said, how dare I? What are you talking about? And she said, it was a female. She said, I've heard you're just a wonderful professor. How dare you leave the students in the lurch like that? And I was just like, bye, I'm out of here. So, um, so you left, you finished out the fall. I finished out the fall. You had your child in the spring. Right. And then um, how did you move from there to a different teaching position? Um, well, I do want to tell you before we leave children, I made sure to plan my second pregnancy on a semester break so that I wouldn't have a hassle, which is what a lot of women mm -hmm. our age did. It's like, no, I don't want to have to deal with, you know, the university saying something because nobody had maternity leave then. Yeah. And so I just planned my second child on the semester break, had the baby, and then went back to work so it wasn't a problem. So one well, child is born in February and the other? December. Um, so then your question was what? How you got to the next um, legal, legal, next position in legal academia. So you stopped this job in December, presumably, or maybe January by the time you had done grading, had your child, and then when did you start at a new job? So then I started, um, USD has a paralegal program, and so I started teaching in the paralegal program, and that to me was ideal because it was part time. I was still getting to teach, but I had a lot of time mm -hmm. with my baby. And did you take time off to be with your baby before you started in the paralegal program? Uh, he was born in February and I started teaching in June, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought I had a perfect life. I loved the teaching, I loved teaching in the paralegal program. Um, I liked the woman who ran the paralegal program, and I thought I would stay there very happily for a while until um, the dean at Western State contacted me and said, there's a position, um, do you want it? Mm -hmm. And it wasn't a permanent position, so actually I've done this twice in my life now. Um, a professor had left between torts one and torts two, and I think this one I had a few weeks notice and I'm like I didn't like torts very much remember that mm -hmm. professor on the earlier story I didn't have a lot of respect <laughs> for my torts class so I had never thought about torts but it was a teaching position it could lead to a permanent position my husband had a job that he wasn't very mobile and it was like if I want a job in town I need to take advantage of every opportunity so I was teaching torts too with never having taught towards one or really remember towards one. So I madly learned 
all of Torts 1 in about a week and a half and then started in on Torts 2 and made a number of mistakes <laughs> in teaching, but um, then that led into then applying for and getting a full-time position there. Mm -hmm. Did you apply for and get a full-time position at that same school at Western State? Yeah. Yes. And how did that come about? Was it like within a year there was an opening or did they create something for you? No, there was, um, there were three, they were doing a lot of hiring. So they hired three people one year and three people another year. So that was just through the traditional interviewing process. Okay. Um, what was the faculty diversity like then at Western State? Were it was there pretty other good. women? Were there oh, yeah. of color? Yeah, it was, it was pretty good. Um, Western State, which later became Thomas Jefferson, since the time I've been there, Gender was not an issue in terms of women not just being hired, but women in tenure track positions, women who are tenured, women who are deans, women who are associate deans. Um, it really, it, it wasn't an issue. And what about with regard to race? Um, that was an issue. <laughs> <laughs> there were no people of color when I started there. Mm -hmm. And I was probably there five, six years before we hired the first person of color. Mm -hmm. And then slowly it increased. So when you started, or maybe over time while you were there, did you perceive any obstacles that were related to gender, whether it was you know, with regard to students or colleagues or the board, anyone that made it maybe more difficult for you than for others? Um, I wouldn't say that I experienced a lot of difficulty. Um, I know a lot of other women did. I would say in the beginning, you know, given my stature and I was young, you know, short young women tend to get a lot of challenges, but um, the word that a lot of students put in their evaluations of me is intimidating. So I think that I just decided mm -hmm. I'm going to be really strict. I mean, I'd be fun and I'd crack jokes, but, you know, if students wanted an excuse for not doing an assignment or, you know, can I do this, can I, I was just like, no, you know, so I think my reputation preceded me of, mm -hmm. you better be, I mean, a lot of students were just like, you better be prepared in her class, so um, that's how I chose to handle it. And how do you think your reputation and um, your relationship with students changed over time, over the years that you've been teaching? Um, ironically, I really loved the early years because when I first started teaching, we were a second career school, and so almost everybody in the classes were they were my age or sometimes older, mm -hmm. and it was wonderful teaching them. They just they were very motivated. They you know had a lot of other responsibilities. A lot of them had children and a full time job and were going to school, mm -hmm. and there was just mutual respect. Um, now the um, and as time went on, we be the demographics became much more traditional, 22 to 25 year olds, mm -hmm. um, without as much life experience. And so I don't think of the classroom environment quite as rich as when you have people from all these very diverse backgrounds, but um, it was still fun and I still enjoyed it. But that's, that's kind of the biggest change I remember. Mm -hmm. Do you think your students had any different experience with you or with any of the other women teachers as opposed to the main, the male professors that they had? So do you think what they got out of your classes was different in any way because you're a woman than they would have gotten from a male professor? You know, I used to think that, but now I think it's very individual. And, you know, there's women professors, not all women professors do everything the same way, not all male professors do. Do I think I served as, you know, I tried to serve as a mentor, I tried to serve as a role model, so I think that's helpful for the women. But I don't think all female professors necessarily do that, and mm -hmm. there's some great mentors who are male professors to both female and male students, so I didn't really have that experience. Did you have mentors once you got to Western State or later Thomas Jefferson? Were there people who you looked up to as role models or people who took an interest in your career? Um, the person who eventually became, well, the person who hired me was a, the female dean at the time. Mm -hmm. And then the, the, the man who replaced her, Ken Vandeveld, was a wonderful mentor. He was just fantastic, you know. In what way? How was he great? Um, one, he was a fantastic role model. I mean, he just was, 
creative and hardworking, and he just had these visions that nobody, the rest of us there wouldn't have had that vision, and he would just kind of share the vision and then say, are you on for the ride? And then just, it was wonderful, because we really helped to build mm -hmm. what I thought was a very special place, and I will admit, there's no way I would have had Ken's vision to, to do that. And so I think Ken was a wonderful role model and a wonderful mentor. Um, and then also somebody else who was hired the same time that I was, who ended up being the associate dean under Ken for a long time, Mary Beth Harold. Um, but we were more peers, but still mm -hmm. really good support system for each other. It sounds like... Um you know, when you started at the firm, there was another woman hired at the same time as you, and you could sort of draw on that peer mentorship or, right. you know, working together within a cohort. Um, is that something you think was similar with this other faculty member in terms of your experience in legal academia as well, where there's another woman and you started together? And I think so, because the other, other than the dean, the other women who were more senior to me, I'm trying to think how many there were, there weren't that, see, that's the other thing. There weren't that many when I started. We were a very, very small faculty, and I don't, less than 10. I don't even, eight. I don't remember how big we were, but we were pretty small. Mm -hmm. um, and the other women really weren't interested in being role models. So I do think that person at the same level can be mm -hmm. wonderful support. Did you have particular professional goals for yourself when you started? Um, you know, they developed over time. You know, for me, I started, um, I think Ken, was, it might be Ken, might have been Mary Beth, will still tease me about it because in my interview, I said, just no administrative work. I will, you know, publish, I will teach, I just hate administrative work. Mm -hmm. And a year after I was hired, I was the associate dean, so, <laughs> or no, not the associate dean, I was the, um, faculty chair. We had an unusual hierarchy and faculty chair was like the liaison between the dean and the faculty. So it was a fairly um, important position and so I started doing that after a year and it was like, well, that's, and then I just, and then I actually love administrative work. So How um, do you think they selected you to do it and why did you say yes? Um, well, it was not well planned. It was at a meeting, a faculty meeting, where we were going to elect the faculty chair and I'd only been there a year so I was like, I don't know what this is all about. And um, a couple people didn't want the person who was running. And so one of them leaned over to me and said, can I put your name in for faculty chair? And I said, I don't know. Should I be opposing this person who's got like 15 years seniority on me? I don't know. What is it? I nominate Julie. So, <laughs> so kind of without my approval, uh -huh. I got nominated and then I got elected. So... Um, too late to say no. Yeah, and then I loved it. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I kind of, given, as you can tell from this interview, a lot of my career has been serendipitous, and it's worked out really well, so. Can you tell me about your involvement in professional organizations or community activities or community groups? Well, this is even the most, this is the most serendipitous um, discussion. So, um, I've always been involved with Lawyers Club, which is our local mm -hmm. Women Lawyers Association and the American Constitution Society and um, other local organizations, but most of my um, work is with the intersex community. And so I've been on the board of the major intersex organization since it started, I don't know, 12 years ago. And um, I do a lot of work with transgender organizations as well. So. That's been my most rewarding community work. What about balancing all the different things you do? So if you think about your job, your community activities, your personal life, um, what kinds of choices did you have to make in terms of finding a way to balance all of those priorities? Um, you know, once the kids were grown up, it was easy. Mm -hmm. While there were kids, it was really hard because I had a workaholic husband mm -hmm. and um, I did the majority of the childcare responsibilities and it was really hard. I just remember not sleeping a lot and just having to juggle constantly. Um, but I just kind of thought, well, this is what I have to do. 
Did you have particular like um, tricks or tips or ways that you could manage the juggle? You know, things that you would try to do so that you could lessen the burden somewhere else or find more time in the day? Um, Besides not sleeping much, right? I don't know. I'll have to think about that. I can't really think of any tricks or tips um, that I could suggest. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit more about your field of specialization? So you mentioned the intersex community. Can you tell us about um, just sort of broadly what that is and what your, your contributions have been? So people who have an intersex condition have biological factors that aren't all male or aren't all female. So their chromosomes may not match their phenotype, which may not match their genitalia. And there's a number of um, areas that are of importance to the intersex community, but by far the most important one is stopping surgeries on babies to conform their genitalia to a norm when it provides no medical benefit and it's being done on the presumption that it will provide a psychological benefit but there's no evidence at all that it provides a psychological benefit. So I had written an article back in 1999 mm -hmm. and it was the first law review article on the intersex community and the legal issues affecting them and so then I was asked to be on the board of directors of this newly formed organization and um, I've really gotten so many rewards and so much pleasure out of my work because I do a whole bunch of different work. I work, I go and speak to hospitals and speak to doctors and speak to legal groups, students, um, policy work, trying to get legislation passed. Um, I've been consulting on some cases. So I really get to do everything, mm -hmm. which is really rewarding. and. In the beginning, I was writing a lot on tra the transgender community and the intersex community. So in the beginning, a lot of my work was for the transgender community. And that was really rewarding, too, because at the time I started writing, um, neither community was getting much attention. I mean, now they're both getting a lot of attention, but not in 1999. And so they really needed a lot of help, and they were very appreciative mm -hmm. of anybody speaking out on their behalf. So. It was really fun to be like at the start of a social justice movement and be working with people who really just started these movements very recently and have accomplished so much mm -hmm. in such a short time. How did you pick that topic? I mean, it's very different from corporations or torts, right? So um, how did you kind of find this area and then so, realize it was a passion for you? So now we're getting to the most serendipitous answer to all my questions. Um, what happened was there was a woman who I I'd actually taught in the graduate LLM program at USD and there was a woman in the class who was older and after she graduated we became friends and we were the kind of friends that he had lunch once or twice a year and at one lunch she said to me I'm intersex and I said I have no idea what that means and she told me and we had this long tearful lunch and then she said look I know everything there is to know about the intersex community you know how to write and publish law review articles. It's peanut butter and jelly. Let's put the two together because nobody is writing in this area. And so that's what happened. She eventually dropped out and I just said, this is really important stuff. She said, just go with it. So that's how I started wow. and got involved in that community. Mm -hmm. So I guess my advice is take opportunities that you wouldn't even imagine are opportunities because you never know where they're going to lead because it really has made for, you know, how many years is that? Um, almost 25. 20. Yeah. I mean, almost 20 years from the time that you were starting to write on it. Right. So, and it's just been pleasurable, rewarding. It's, it's been wonderful. Looking back on your career, are there particular things that you find rewarding now in your experiences? I mean, I would say what we were just talking about, working with these communities. I mean, there's, I still remember after I wrote my first article, I got an email from a woman who ran a transgender youth center in Los Angeles. And she attached all these letters to the email saying, I work, you know, they're homeless, it was homeless transgender youth. And she said, 
I told them about your law review article and I gave them copies of it and they really couldn't read it, but here's the letters that they wrote to you. And it was just, it brought tears to my eyes. It was just like, thank you. Nobody pays any attention to us. Thank you for paying attention to us. And mm -hmm. so, um, to me, working with a community and, and really helping people that aren't in a position to help themselves has been the most rewarding part of the work. What about what's most frustrating? Particular things that stand out as especially frustrating over your career? Oh, uh, I don't know if I can put this on tape. <laughs> Pick one that you're comfortable sharing publicly. You can always edit it out. Um, I would say problems with leadership of the school that I was at and my disagreeing vehemently with the direction the school was going. Mm -hmm. So, looking back, would you change any of the choices that you made or follow some different paths? I know a lot of your paths were serendipitous in the first place, but if you were doing it all over again, would you do some things differently? You know, I, somebody, my son asked me that recently, and I just don't think that way. I just think I've been very lucky, um, and I don't tend to look back and say, how would I do this differently? Because I feel like I've been, had a really great career. Mm -hmm. So I'm interested in the impact that you notice that your career has had. So if you think about your, your institution, if you think about your field, which you've talked a little bit about, if you think about legal education generally, which I think also in your case relates to this field that was you know, completely, not, maybe not even emerging when you started and now has, has really blossomed. Um, what impact do you think your work, your career has had on those three different areas? So on your institution um, and on, in your field and in legal education. Um, so at my institution, I think I was a good role model for other female faculty members, for students. Um, you know, as I said, I usually hold people to pretty high standards, and I think people tend to achieve high standards when you hold them to high standards. So I think I had a positive influence on both students and colleagues, um, including faculty and staff. Um, You know, in the community, I think I've already mm -hmm. talked about that. Um, you know, I just work very intimately with a lot of different people. And I think one of the, the things that's nice about being a law professor is I don't say anything differently than what the advocates say. Mm -hmm. But because I'm a law professor, I get all this street credibility that is totally ridiculous. But <laughs> it's, it is, it's crazy, you know, that I say something that I know somebody else has said because there's another woman that I work with very closely, and we share our PowerPoint slides, and, and she, she, like, I will tell her how, you know, I, something was really well received at a medical conference, and she said, I read your slides, you were much more aggressive than I am when I go speak, but she's mm -hmm. like, oh, well, she's just an advocate. And so it's, I think it's really nice to be a law professor and be able to say, to have them say, oh, well, she's got to be objective if she's a law professor, you know. Mm -hmm. um, Do you think that that has helped move this, create a movement and move this along in legal education too? In legal education? Because there's a law professor doing this work as opposed to advocates. So the fact that you're publishing this in law reviews and things like that, has that had an impact, you think, on legal education generally? I'm not sure what impact it would have on legal education. Like adding to the scholarship, having sort of a different way that people think about it in terms of including the legal I mean, perspective. As, well, as far as changing the law, I mean, it's had a huge effect. I mean, I, I don't know how many court opinions my work is cited in, and, and a number of them that went the way that I advocated mm -hmm. that I don't think they would have if they didn't have legal mm -hmm. authority mm -hmm. behind it. If you were giving advice to a young woman just entering um, legal academia, what would you tell her? That is so hard. Um, it doesn't have to be all of your advice, but maybe a couple of things you've learned along the way. Um, 
Boy, it so much depends. I mean, I would say follow your passion is the first thing. You know, a lot of people, when I first started writing on gender-related issues, um, it's like, well, gender, that's, you know, that you don't want to write on gender. You can't build a career on gender. And luckily, I was at an institution that never followed that policy. But mm -hmm. um, so I would say if you are at an institution that's telling you not to follow your passion because it's not intellectual enough, ignore it and go to another institution if you can. Mm -hmm. um, that'd probably be my biggest piece of advice. Okay. And then can you tell us a little bit about what you're up to now and kind of what's next? Um, well, I'm very happily retired now. Um, so I'm retired from teaching, but what that's given me the opportunity to do is publish more and speak more. So I'm still publishing quite a bit and acting as a consultant quite a bit now that there's more legal cases in the pipeline. And um, the, the intersex community issues have really heated up. So mm -hmm. almost every, no, actually not almost every, every international human rights organization that has studied the issue has said, we need to stop these surgeries. So right now I'm being invited to speak at a number of different medical conferences and to different doctors. And so that's, that's what I'm really enjoying is now just kind of diving in and being able to spend as much time as I want because I don't have as many other demands. Mm -hmm. My children are grown. I don't have to teach. I don't have to do faculty meetings. Mm -hmm. And so it's just wonderful. I'm very lucky. So we're at the end of my formal set of questions, but I want to give you an opportunity to bring up anything else that either to elaborate on something that we've talked about already or to add something that we didn't get a chance to cover. I think you were perfect. Thank you.